off. You know what I'm talking about? Nope, not a magic dragon. Puff, nope, wrong again. Not a small blast of air. And not that cotton ball thingy that people use to apply makeup or clean their ears. No, let's cut to the chase here. I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jock Talk, and today we're going to talk about physically unclonable functions, or puffs. Unclonable, I hear you ask? In semiconductors, we can clone anything, right? We can make nanometer-sized features exactly the same billions of times per chip. Over millions of chips. That's a lot of cloning. One might say it's an attack. A clone war, perhaps. But no, no Jedis were harmed in this episode. <laughs> Puffs are like fingerprints or DNA for chips. Instead of trying to store some encryption key that the bad guys can read and copy, we use the unique process variations that happen on each device to recognize its unique identity. Intrigued? Let's chat with Scott Jones from Maxim Integrated about how Puffs can raise your security to the next level. It's pretty cool. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about physically unclonable functions or puffs and chip DNA from Maxim Integrated. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Amelia. Yeah, I really appreciate being able to talk to you. Okay, so we've talked about security before, but in the context of secure microcontrollers. Today we're talking about a different type of security device, right? Correct, yes, yeah, secure authenticators. Cool. So secure authenticator products as compared to secure micros are devices that are simpler as far as functionality goes. They're fixed function in nature versus micros, which are you know highly programmable. So they'll have fixed algorithms, fixed curves, fixed functions, as I said, operations, fixed key sizes, things like this. But they do have, like secure micros, some security features, which are very important. For example, we're storing keys in a very secure way, data in a very secure way. The cryptography that these products implement is hardware based and we implement countermeasures as well to protect against attacks that these devices will experience. Okay, so Scott, what is a secure authenticator? Sounds kind of like a guard standing at a palace gate or something. None shall pass the secure authenticator. <laughs> it's pretty close to that, actually. So these devices do have some really nice features. For example, a symmetric and asymmetric algorithms as far as the cryptography goes. We offer and provide bidirectional authentication with the devices. So for example, in a system where we have some host controller and a peripheral, the host controller would want, for example, to make sure that that peripheral is authentic. So that would be one direction of yeah. the authentication. And in the other direction, we potentially would need the host controller to authenticate itself to the peripheral you know, before operations are performed, as, as sure. an example. Secure data storage, secure use counting, for example, uh, in medical applications, if there's a medical tool. These are often designed such that they can only be used a certain number of times for safety reasons, for performance reasons. Secure session key generation, for example, if we have an IoT endpoint that needs to communicate with some web server, we need to establish keys on both sides, our products can actually offload that task from a local microcontroller. Secure general purpose I.O., or making available random numbers, high quality random numbers to a local microcontroller. Okay, so Scott, now everyone I know seems to wish we could go back to a time that never existed, when we didn't have to lock our doors, left our keys in the ignition, stacked our gold bars on the front lawn. Okay, maybe not that last one, but that seems like not a reality in IoT, right? For sure. I mean, if there were no threats that existed in the world of IoT, we wouldn't need security. Sure. And the fact is that uh, everything is, is becoming connected these days. There's reports that, you know, over 500,000 IoT devices will be compromised in the current year. Wow. Yeah. Secure authenticators can't protect and cover any and all threats, but a, a very large number of these threats certainly can be addressed by these devices. So, Scott, how bad are the bad guys out there? Are we mainly protecting ourselves against casual intruders? Absolutely not. The bad guys are, are very, very sophisticated bad guys. Mm. They've got equipment that's as complex, as sophisticated as the equipment that semiconductor manufacturers have as far as evaluating, deprocessing, doing failure analysis on ICs. So these are wow. very, very, very well-equipped folks out there that we're having to protect our products against. Okay, so I've heard of 
puffs before, not the magic dragon kind, the physically unclonable kind. How exactly do those work? So they take advantage of random characteristics that just natively exist in a semiconductor device. So we're going to utilize these random characteristics to ultimately produce a key. And I mean, if we think about keys, for the most part, keys are random numbers. So yeah. there you go. We can take advantage of random characteristics and produce a random number or a key. In addition to producing a random number, we need to make sure that it is repeatable. So sure. every time a part powers up, for example, and a cryptographic operation is performed, that, that key needs to be the same key that it was at time zero. If, right. a, if a bit ever flips, then you know the key is, is useless at that point forward and the product no longer works. As well, it needs to deliver high cryptographic quality, good randomness. If we think about the implementation of Puff and using a Puff to generate a key, yeah. We never actually store the key on the device. The only time we need the key is when a cryptographic operation is performed. At that point, we generate the key. After the operation is complete, we instantaneously delete the key from the device. So it's never there otherwise. And so the beauty with that is you can't steal a key that isn't there. Right. Okay. So puffs are a little organic to the specific device, like a fingerprint or DNA. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Each and every device or IC that we produce has unique characteristics, just like DNA. And in fact, we've named our technology Chip DNA for that reason. And in our implementation, what we're taking advantage of as far as randomness goes on a per device basis is analog characteristics. So Maxim's really good at analog. Mm -hmm. Based on our expertise with analog design, device physics, we're taking advantage of a very well understood analog variation from device to device. This variation or mismatch is fundamentally what we're taking advantage of in our Puff architecture. Okay, cool. But Scott, I'm a little concerned about reliability. It seems like passing the Puff on variations might allow the Puff itself to vary too much. Are, are these things dependable? And you should be concerned about reliability. And this is something that we've evaluated in, in a very significant way. If we look at our implementation and think about from a time zero perspective, how much margin exists from a Puff bit, whether it's a binary one or a binary zero, how much margin exists from an aging perspective before that bit could potentially flip. Sure. We've got significant margin in our design. And now when we look at the overall aging that can occur from various conditions, that overall or total aging is well within the margin that our design allows. Okay, so Scott, what does that mean to me about reliability over the lifetime of my system? Yeah, so what that means about the reliability over the lifetime is, if we think about key error rate, for example, yeah. let's define it as the probability that one bit within a key would flip, you know, for example, from a logic one to a logic zero over the life of the product. So life of the product would mean, for example, 10 years of end use yeah. over operating voltage, operating condition, all of these, these sorts of parameters. When we look at those conditions, our product actually performs to a key error rate of less than five parts per billion. Wow. Okay, so are we really sure that the variations on a particular type of device won't tend to come out too similar, giving me not really random keys? Randomness is an incredibly important parameter for a, a puff device, for sure. And, and this is something that we've evaluated as well. There are some test suites that exist in industry as defined by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is sort of the standard, if you will, that everyone follows. Yeah. And we've evaluated our product, thousands of units, the puff output over thousands of units against these NIST test suites, which ultimately evaluate the consistency of that data against a random sample. And, and we've just got really excellent performance against those test suites. Excellent. Okay, so taking this up a level, how will I use chip DNA in my system? So in your system, chip DNA could be used in a few different ways. Okay. For example, in one case, we could use chip DNA and the output from chip DNA as a key that in turn is used to encrypt all information that is stored on a part. So if a bad guy gets access to the part, extracts information from the part, it's encrypted and he can do nothing with it. In another scenario, we could use chip DNA output as a private key for a asymmetric ECDSA type operation. So it is directly used as the private key for signing data. Cool, okay. Other scenarios might be similar to the first where we use chip DNA to encrypt information stored external to a part in flash or E squared, for example. And then finally, fundamentally, chip DNA can become 
just the anchor of trust for a processor and utilized by cryptographic operations to ultimately unlock layered security within a solution. Okay, and finally, of course, what products are you guys selling that incorporate chip DNA? So we've just announced our first product. It's the DS28E38. This is one of our deep cover secure authenticators. It provides ECDSA or asymmetric crypto-based challenge and response authentication. If we look at some of the blocks that this part provides, it has hardware-based crypto, which is based on elliptic curve crypto operating from a prime 256-bit curve has SHA-256 within it as well as part of the data path for signing. It has a very, very good NIST compliant random number generator with access to those random numbers from the outside. So a micro might need some high quality random numbers and this part can produce it. Cool. Very, very reliable product. We've talked about this already. And it operates from our single contact one wire interface, which is really a, a nice interface, especially in applications where there might be limited contacts between some host system and a peripheral. And we want to include this functionality in the peripheral and we don't have a lot of spare connectors to make that happen. Very cool. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Scott. Oh, I really appreciate it. Have a great day. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about chip DNA from Maxim Integrated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal.